Good morning, all my YouTube viewers, all my YouTube friends and family. My name is Quentin Avery. I go by Avery Morehouse on Facebook Live. And I just want to thank you guys for watching me on your phones and inviting me into your homes. Man, I had this video that I wanted to lay down a while ago, maybe last week. I should have recorded it last week. You know, sometimes, you know, it's like one of those um, musicians, singers or, or rappers, man. They just, they got these lyrics in their head and they want to just lay it down on a beat. Sometimes I feel like that. Sometimes I have material. I just want to come home and do a YouTube video and just lay it on down. But what I'm saying is, is that I got, I started working on new material. And I kept going, and the next day I started working on new material, and then this one just got lost in the shuffle. But I want to lay this one down, lay this track down, like a rapper would say. I want to lay this one down, and that way I can get it behind me before it gets lost in the shuffle. But I'm an artist. I'm a spiritual artist, man. I, I got so much material to lay down that I just need to just stay in the studio and just keep on working. So, with that being said, uh, Galatians uh, 3 and 1. And those of you who, who, who want to study, let's get to work. If y'all ready to study, let's get to work. Once again, like I always tell you, spiritual leaders and Pharisees, ain't nobody tripping on y'all. We ain't scared of y'all around here. We got a new breed of teaching going on. And if you either go and follow or get on because we're not following that old stuff no more. It's the same scriptures. Don't get it twisted. It's the same scriptures. But when Jesus came on the scene, they said, whoa, is this a new teaching? <laughs> That's what they said. Is this a new teaching? And then when the Pharisees came around, they said, um, where did he get this learning and understanding from without being taught? They want to know what school we went to. Where did he study at? Man, I'm 43 years old. And when I was 20 years old in the house of worship, I saw ministers, deacons, pastors. I see those same guys today. They still know the same information that they knew 20 years ago. It's sad, but it's true. They haven't grown. They still talking the same talk, walking the same walk. So we ain't got time for that. All right, let's go to work. Galatians 3. And one says, you foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you before your very eyes? Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed as crucified. Um, Paul said, who has bewitched you? And Malcolm X would have said, who has bamboozled you? Who tricked you? Who ran game on you? Uh, those who have low Bible IQ, those who are spiritually square, the L7s, who bewitched you, who bamboozled you, who ran game on you, who cut in on you. Um, so then in Galatians 5 and 7, it says, you were running a good race, who cut in on you to keep you from obeying the truth. Now, who cut in on you? Like a traffic, you know, like you in traffic and someone cut you off. Who cut in on you from obeying the truth? See, these people, they clearly heard the message and they clearly seen with their very eyes. Some of you have, well, if you live in today, you haven't seen with your own eyes. But some of you have never heard the truth. What I mean is that some of you, you go to the house of worship but you've never read the scriptures for yourself. You've never heard the truth. So no one's really cutting in on you. You've just been tricked every time you go to believe in whatever it is that they tell you to believe. But who cut in on you from obeying the truth? First thing before someone can even cut in on you, you got to get the truth. You got to know the truth to even know what path, or what race it is that you either supposed to be on, 
or what race it is that you even supposed to be racing. You got to know the rules of the race. If you run in a, a one mile or a certain amount of meters or a relay, whatever it is, we always got to put things into human, into earthly um, realm so that we can make it make sense in the heavenly realm. So in 2 Timothy 4 and 7, we go going to work. I hope you jot these scriptures down. I hope you write them down. I hope you look at them later because this is how we learn to obey the truth. We don't learn to obey the truth by showing up to a building once a week and then walk out the same way we came in. Jesus said you have to change. And if you refuse to change, that's your problem. Uh, 2 Timothy 4 and 7 says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Paul is fighting some type of fight here. Because he said, if I fought wild beasts at Ephesus, um, such and such and such and such, he said, we might as well eat and drink for tomorrow we die. Uh, if there's no law, then everything we do is permissible. Why trip with people on things that they do if we all sinners and there's no way out of the sinful nature? So, hey, we just need to just eat and drink for tomorrow we die. We don't need to hold anybody accountable. You know, if you go to work 12 hours a day and the milkman and the postman come to your house and say, man, uh, who was messing with my woman? What, what, uh, you probably was out doing something. She probably was in doing something. But nobody need to trip because without, without law or without sin, without law, then everything is permissible. But we have law. We have lawlessness and we have law. So there is a rule to what we do. You know, there's a street code. I wouldn't know anything about that because I wasn't raised in the street. But there's a street code. But there's also a written code. Yeah, Paul wrote about that in Romans chapter 2. There's a written code, but the written code is not written. It's written on the hearts and minds of the believers. But you would have had to read the scriptures to understand what the written code is. And in the street code, it's nothing that's written. It's just some things that you're supposed to know. I see on t-shirt, snitches get stitches. That comes, that comes from people are supposed to know that when you get arrested, you keep your mouth shut. But the police said, hey man, you, 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 you're never going to see your wife and kids again. Oh, your, 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 your wife is expected to deliver a new child. You're going to miss the birth of your child. If you have a grandmother who's sick on her deathbed, you're going to miss that. And people talk because they don't keep what they call the street code. You know, but people don't keep the street code. There's a written code. People don't keep the written code. Some people, do. You, in either case, you don't have an excuse not to keep the code. You can say, I didn't know. The Bible says uh, that, that people are without excuse in Romans 1. The, the, uh, uh, l let me read it real quick. Romans uh, chapter 1, just re really quick before I get completely, uh, whatever. I'm just going to go ahead and keep the video going till I get done. Anyway, it says... Um, for since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. Now, snitches are going to get those stitches because you don't have no excuse. If you told on me, I'm going to bust your head. Now, well, I'm not going to do it, but they're going to do it. <laughs> so anyway... Paul is fighting, I fought the good fight. He's fighting some kind of fight that some of you don't even know you in a fight. No, some of you are just spectators. Some of you are observers. And some of you are just followers. 
there's no fight. Fight or flight is a psychological term that deals with people and animals. Either you're going to fight or you're going to run. Okay? Did mama raise a punk? I don't know. So, Paul's fighting some type of fight. He's running some type of race. And he's keeping some type of faith. All right? Otherwise, let us eat, drink, for tomorrow we die. So, without a good race or without a good fight and a good race or knowing that race and that fight, then everything you do on this life or this path, whichever way you decided to go, anything's permissible. Okay? So, without the rules and instruction from God, we can live however we want to. Anything is permissible. Uh, then, what's the point of life at all? If we just live to die. What is the point of life at all if you live in to die? Do you really think life is all about living to die? Do you think life is all about dying? <clears throat> That's one of the noises on the game show when you got the answer wrong. In life, you're born what they call dead on arrival DOA. You're born a sinner, conceived at my mother's birth, sinful at birth, born into sin, shaped in iniquity, born into a sinful nature. So you're already dead, spiritually dead, but life is about living, being alive in Christ. It's about living. It's not living to die. It's being born dead, understanding the message of God, excuse me, Understanding, obeying the message of truth, coming to an understanding of truth, and then living, being made alive in Christ. Wake up, rise. Uh, let me see. That's Ephesians 5 and 16. Let me grow over here. And please don't ask, how does he know these scriptures? Man, how do you not know the scriptures? This is the most important thing of our lives. So... You value what's important to you, and I'll value what's important to me. All right, so Ephesians 5 and 14, this is why it is said, wake up, sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. That's not from the movie Thriller. That's not a person that's already dead and is six feet deep. He needs to wake up and, and unbury himself. No, nothing like that. It's just that we were born dead spiritually, and we need to wake up and become alive. So then life is not about living to die. And it's not about death. It's about living. It's about eternal life. That's what the uh, people hang up the signs, John three sixteen at the football games. Uh, it's whoever should believe in the Messiah, whoever should believe in Jesus, they won't perish. They have eternal life. But our bodies... Outwardly, we are perishing. We are wasting away. But inwardly, and that's what life's about. It's about inwardly. And that's why I said, hey, the scriptures are important to me. So don't ask, how do I know so many scriptures? They're important to me because I store up treasures in heaven. That's what I do because it's important to me. So it's not about death. It's about living. So when this outer tent, this earthly tent is destroyed. I have so much treasure stored up. Man, I'm going to be balling. <laughs> I'm going to be balling, man. So uh, when y'all see me, if you see me again in light, in the future past or whatever you want to call it, you're going to be like, man, I should have been doing like you was doing on earth, laying down these tracks, storing up treasures in heaven, reaping what you sow, sowing in the spirit. It ain't too late. It ain't too late. All right. 1 Corinthians 9 and 24 through 27 says this. This is more Apostle Paul's work. He says, Do you not know that in a race all runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way 
as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. Goes into strict training. What does that look like? What does strict training look like? Okay. They do it to get a crown that will not last. But we do it. See, two different people. But we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Eternal life is a crown that lasts forever. That championship belt gets passed on to every mortal figure. You can't keep that belt. O.J. Simpson was fighting for his trophies, his Heisman trophy. But when you die, it gets passed down maybe to your kids. Your kid didn't earn no Heisman trophy, but it's my dad's. And he passes it down and passes it down. That crown won't last. <laughs> People don't get it. That crown won't last. Soon, they will forget about you. You'll be written in history somewhere. But if they wouldn't remind us every Super Bowl of some guy named Vince Lombardi, we would have forgot about him too. So it's only a matter of time before they name the trophy after somebody else. And then his name will be forgotten. But this word will outlive everybody because it's immortal. The words of God will live forever. And that's why I spend so much time storing up those treasures. So he says, Therefore, I do not run like someone running aimlessly. I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. No, I strike a blow to my body and make it my slave so that I have preached to others, uh, so, that, uh, so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. Hey Amen. Paul is seriously talking about a real race that runners run and you can be disqualified. Hey, there, 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 there's rules. There's rules in the streets. There's rules in the spiritual realm. And if you don't know the rules, you can be disqualified. If you look over in Old Testament, um, let's see, go to Ezekiel. And, 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 and then even I'm amazed at myself right now. I'm pulling up Ezekiel. Dude, I got 30, maybe 40 something chapters. But I must have studied Ezekiel enough to know. And maybe I haven't. Uh, when they when they say to a wicked person, well, maybe I haven't. Oh, here it is. Let me see. Again, to the righteous person. Well, Ezekiel has a scripture in here somewhere that I can't find. And I think it's 33. Let's see. Now, in chapter 33, could be here, maybe not. If not, I'll just tell you what I think it says. Here it is. Um, it says that Ezekiel 33 and 11, as surely it says, Say to them, as surely as I live, declares the sovereign Lord, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked. Rather that they turn from their ways and live. You see what I mean? This is what life is about. Living. Not dying. When you stay wicked, you're dying. When you turn from wickedness, you're living. But you got to know what wickedness is. And you got to learn how to reject it. I'll take you to Proverbs later. About when God says, I hate pride. I hate arrogance. I hate evil behavior. Fear of the Lord is to hate these things. Uh, we'll go there later. Anyway, he says, but rather that they turn from their ways and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways. Why will you die, people of Israel? Now, this is the rules, okay? Check it out. This is the rules. It's not in the Bible. Like People always wonder like, how you study the Bible, but... I don't know. Therefore, son of man, say to your people, if someone who is righteous, right? So you got a person living righteous. Someone who is righteous. 
disobeys that person's former righteousness will count for nothing. You hear that? He's righteous. He disobeys. His former righteousness counts for nothing. Paul said he doesn't want to be disqualified for the prize. You can be disqualified. He says, if, and, if, and if someone who is wicked repents, that person's former wickedness will not bring condemnation. These are the rules. Some people's sins are obvious, reaching the place of judgment ahead of them. Other people's sins are behind, trail behind them. That's in 2 Timothy. I can't even give you that scripture right now. Former. This is behind them. Some of ahead and some behind them. But there are rules to it. He said, if someone who is wicked repents, that person's former wickedness will not bring condemnation. The righteous person whose sins will not be allowed to live, even though they were formerly righteous. If I tell a righteous person, that they will surely live, but then they turn in their, uh, keyword there, like, you know, self-righteous people. If they, but they, okay, but then they trust in their righteousness and do evil. None of the righteous things that person has done will be remembered. They will die for the evil they have done. If I say to the wicked person, you will surely die, but they then turn away from their evil sin and do what is just and right. If they give back what they took and pledge for a loan, return what they have stolen, follow the decrees that give life and do no evil, that person will surely live. They will not die. None of the sins that person has committed will be remembered against them. They have done what is just and right. They will surely live. These, that's law. These are, everything God says is law. Look at Psalms 19. From the mouth of God, uh, Deuteronomy 32, from the mouth of God, he's raining on tender plants. His, his words, his teaching are descending like dew. Everything, this came through his prophet or priest uh, Ezekiel, this is from the creator. I read that from the scriptures. So you don't want to be disqualified for the prize by running the wrong race. See, people in life, they run a race that goes north, south, east, west. Okay? But the race in the past, see, you got to, once you realize there's a specific race that I'm supposed to be running and there's a specific path I'm supposed to be on, then you need to uh, switch tracks. You need to uh, turn this thing around. But see, the geographical location is not an earthly location. It's a spiritual geographical location of heaven is where you're headed. Once you realize the race and the path that you're supposed to be on. Now, there is a specific race that all believers run uh, and, and they know what that race is. And then there's a race that the unbelievers run. They're chasing wealth. They're chasing career. They're running north. They're running south. They're running in a direction where the terrain is really level. Um, Proverbs 15 and 24. This is what it reads. The path of life leads upward for the prudent to keep them from going down to the realm of the dead. Our path leads upward. And there's another path that leads down. You understand? So it don't matter about going north, south, east, west, the path that you're supposed to be on goes up because we all going down. So when you're on earth, it's not about north, south, east, west. 
It's about being on the right path, running the right race, running the fighting the good fight, keeping the faith. What did Paul say? Let me see. He said, he said, I fought the good fight. So when I'm on my race, once I get myself equipped with the truth, get out my way. I'm swinging my sword and I'm on my way. And on my way, my job is to help as many people as I can by living the correct life, living, fighting the good fight, running the good race, keeping the faith. Somebody's watching me. Somebody's listening to me. So I got to make sure that I'm saying the correct words and I'm living the correct life. No matter if you tell me that it can't be done. The Bible tells me that it can be done. I can do all things through Christ that gives me strength. And in my difficulties and hardships and weakness, in my weakness, you are made powerful. Uh, and, and, uh, I'm sorry, that's... um. I, I, I don't like to butcher scriptures, So, but I know where they're at. So I'm going to 2 Corinthians chapter 12. He said, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, insults, hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties, for when I am weak, I am strong. Why? Because the Holy Spirit fights the battles for me. All I do is prepare myself for the race, keep the faith, and stay on the path. Run the right race, you see? And now, once I do that, everything I say, everything I do, I don't win. You know, I'm not winning everything, but over time... It, 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 it always, God is always victorious. It may not be me victorious, but he's always victorious. So the, the prudent, the path of life leads upward. Now, the prudent is one who is showing thought towards the future. Actions and thoughts towards the future. The future is not what you're going to do after high school, what kind of job you're going to get after you graduate from college. The future is eternal life. So the prudent, the path of life leads upward for the prudent. The prudent is the one that is showing thought towards where they are going to spend eternity. Very, very, very important. But a lot of people just live to die. They're not living to live on. And that mentality, what can I say? I have nothing to say about that mentality. Um, now, let's see. The path that leads upward. Upward, you can never stop going up. Solomon said, if I build this temple, will the most high really dwell in this temple? We know that the highest, even the highest heavens cannot contain him. He's all powerful. He's almighty. He, he, he created the earth and the heavens with an outstretched arm, with his power, with his wisdom. We know that all of him is not dwelling in the temple, dwelling in people. He has enough spirit to dwell in all of us, to create the universe. He's, what can I say? I can't say enough about him. I wish everybody knew enough about him to where they would have fear for him because it is a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. I'm not falling into the hands of the living God. I'm already in. <laughs> I'm already in the hands of the living God through the Messiah. I'm in Christ. So we have access, Paul said, we have access to the Father through Christ, through the sacrifice, through the curtain, which is his body. I'm rambling, but I'm rambling in scripture. If you know those scriptures, you know they came from Hebrews. You know they came from Ephesians. I have access. That's in Ephesians. Uh, 
uh, through the curtain, which is his body. That's in Hebrews. But the don't let anyone cut in on you. You know, once you get the truth, begin to build on that solid foundation, the rock, the words of God. Begin to build on that. People are going to come just like that parable Jesus taught. The birds are going to come eat those seeds. The seeds are the word of God. They're going to get choked out because of the worries of life. They're not going to, the seeds in the word of God, people are going to tell them to you and you, they're not going to have any root. You know, it's the parable. I'm kind of getting it off memory, but it's the parable. When the sower goes to sow his seed, either it's not, either the seed won't take root in you and they won't reap a harvest. So, um, what can I say about that? Don't let anyone cut in on you from obeying the truth. Period. Okay? So, the path of the unbeliever is lived and walked by sight. But we know the path of the believer is lived and walked by faith. The righteous shall live by faith. There's a lot of things that we have to see in our minds. Um, Jesus told Nicodemus, you can't see the kingdom of heaven unless you've been born again. We've been born living to die. We've been born again, dead, now we live in, made alive in Christ. A circumcision not performed with human hands, but performed by Christ. So that's a whole different mentality, a whole different way of living. And so now, change your mentality. Romans 12, don't conform, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. I've heard that preached so many times, but never taught. How do we do that? How? We can't do that with sermons once a week. It's impossible. Okay? Now, when you walk in north, south, east, and west, what are you going to do? You got to go to work. You got to graduate. You got to go to college. You got to get a career. You got to marry. You got to have kids. You got to find yourself a good church. Um, you got to invest in your 401k. You got to get life insurance, uh, uh, burial, and then we hope that you made it. That's no confidence whatsoever. No confidence whatsoever. When you live like that, you are leading or walking into what we call a wilderness. And the further you get in a wilderness or in a forest, if the fall comes, if you don't have a guide for your life, a guide in the wilderness, a guide in the forest, if you don't have a compass, if you don't have a direction, you will walk so far that by the time you turn around, you don't know which direction is north, south, east, or west. You're lost. And that's how it is without the gospel. That's how it is without Christ. You get so far that you get lost. You get so far that you get deaf because you can no longer hear the voice of God. You get so far you get so far that you become blind because you no longer can see the direction that you're going. You don't even know where north and southwest is. You don't have a compass. So that makes you blind, lost, without the gospel. So the scripture in Proverbs 14 and 2 says, There is a way that appears to be right, but in the end it leads to death. Now, there is a path for the unbeliever. It's called broad. Everybody knows a broad way. It's a big strip of, of, of land and many people come to Broadway. Stars are made on Broadway. It's a lot of people can get there. There is a, um, there's a, there's a narrow path that only a few will find. But on the Broadway... There's room for many people to walk. 
So there's a way that seems right to man, that seems right, but in the end, leads in death. And then there's a narrow path that only a few find. So currently right now, for all of you who are out there on in a wilderness, in a forest, there's a rescue team out looking for you right now. There is a search team out looking for those who need to be rescued. That's people like me. And who else? I don't know. But our path that leads upward, we're looking for the lost people who are looking for the path to go up. Sounds crazy? But the people who are lost going north, east, south, west are somehow they don't know the way and they're looking. But we're also looking and we have a rescue team out looking for the ones that are lost that need to be rescued. Why else would Paul say, what a wretched man I am who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? The people who know that their bodies are subject to death are looking for a heavenly country. They look and they just don't know the way. Like Thomas said, Messiah, he told the Messiah, how can I, we know the way? We don't know where you're going. A lot of people are lost and they want to be rescued. Genuinely want to be rescued. There's just not enough of you out there that are living by example and living that righteous life with confidence without these uh, hypocrite, hypocrisy type of Pharisee figures that tell you that you can't do it, that scare you into a turtle shell and make you feel like what you're doing is not the correct way. We're not scared of you no more. We will fight you and we will use the, the word to cut you. The word of God is alive and active, sharper than a two-edged sword. Anything you say, I will combat you with scripture. I would love to have debates with any one of you. Paul said in Romans 7 and 24, what a wretched man I am who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death. The word wretched is the state of misery, sad, distressed, lost, blind, poor, naked, and pitiful. That's what we are without the gospel of Jesus. Naked, which means mortal. When you are without Christ or you don't have Christ, if you have Christ, you're clothed. Christ is immortality. That's why it says, believe and you will not perish, but have eternal life or everlasting life. Because naked is mortal, but you need to be clothed with the power of God, with the power of the resurrection. The power of the resurrection was something that we read about. We didn't witness with our own eyes. The Galatians did. That's why Paul said, who bewitched you, who cut in on you for obeying the truth. You clearly seen it. We didn't see it, but we believe it. And now we also believe in the power of resurrection in our dead bodies. So reckon yourself dead to sin, but alive to Christ. Now, the path of the believer, the narrow road that leads to life, Scripture says only a few find it. I said that already. But Proverbs 11, uh, excuse me, Proverbs 12 and 28. In the way of righteousness, there is life. We've been talking about that the whole time. From Ezekiel, the way of righteousness, there is life. Along that path is immortality. Genuinely, there are people along our path, they want immortality. They don't know how to clothe themselves with immortality. They're naked. They don't know how to clothe themselves. They're on the path. They're lost. They want to be rescued. They just don't know who to follow. There's so many leaders out there, so many inspirational speakers, motivational speakers, uh, um, lots to choose from, but they really want to follow the path. They want to get on the right path. The path is in mortality. So in Proverbs 11 and 30, it says the fruit of the righteousness 
is the tree of life, and the one who is wise saves lives. See, when it comes to the tree of life, we focus on Adam and Eve and their tree of life. There's another tree of life in the book of Revelations where Eden is restored. But the book of Proverbs says the fruit of the uh, the fruit of the righteous is the tree of life. And the one who is wise saves lives. The fruit of the righteous is the tree of life. So by our words and our path of life, which leads upward, is the fruit of the righteous and is the tree of life. The path that we are on is a path towards immortality. And those who follow our path will be rescued and saved. So in, in Proverbs 28 and 10, Listen to this. Whoever leads the upright along an evil path will fall into their own trap. But the blameless will receive a good inheritance. No matter what you do, you're leading. Sometimes you think you will follow her, but there are three followers following you. No matter what you do, whoever leads the upright along an evil path, person might be saying, I wasn't even leading them on an evil path. Nobody told them to follow me. No matter. You leading the whole generation with the things that you do. Don't matter. You're going to fall into your own trap. Those are not my words. Whoever leads the upright along an evil path will fall into their own trap. But the blameless will receive good inheritance. There's a way to live blameless. There are many people in the Bible that you can read that lived blameless. Jesus was not the only one that lived blameless. You would have to assume that God chose an imperfect vessel to carry his son in Mary. Joseph, faithful to the law. Noah, blameless in his generation. There was no law in his time. The law didn't come until Moses. So in his generation, it was perfect. Enoch, Abel, Lot, read the scriptures. John the Baptist, scripture says he had the Holy Spirit while he was still in the womb. So, it doesn't matter how you live. It does, uh, excuse me, it, uh, oh, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. I got a whole bunch of words here. But, uh, so Paul said, Go into strict training. What does that look like? Now, in this scripture, I wrote the word down, R-I-D, read. Because when you go into strict training, we know what strict training looks like. Uh, well, actually, most of you don't. Um, if you are a, um, a athlete, there's there's going to be some early mornings, some, some stairs, some bleachers, some... Some, some running, some heavy diets, uh, cutting out of sugars and alcohols and things that most people do not uh, deny themselves of. When these athletes go into strict training to prepare for a particular game, there's some strict training that they must do to prepare themselves for the race, the fight, the game, whatever you want to call it. Now, the word writ means make someone free of. Now, in the book of Colossians 3 and 8, it's going to say, but now you must also rid yourself of all such things as these. 
anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Make yourself free of those. Meaning that's not your normal behavior, normal action. It's not just a, I can't wait for somebody to say something so I can cuss them out. Give me an opportunity. I, I, I can't wait to cuss them out. Give them a piece of my mind. Rid yourself of that. Make yourself free of that. Um, in another scripture, 1 Peter 2 and 1, therefore rid yourselves of all malice and all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. Slander is spoken. The other scripture says slander and filthy language from your lips, whether it's filthy language or malicious or lies. Saying something about another person that is not even true. Rid yourself. So in Proverbs 8 and 13, it says to fear the Lord is to hate evil. Identify yourself with evil. Get really comfortable with evil and then learn how to hate evil. You know, when I was a kid, it had to be before 10 because we moved to Wisconsin at 10 or maybe 9. So maybe when I was 8, my grandmother told me she, what she believed. It wasn't in the scripture. She said, we don't, she said, hate is a strong word. We don't hate, we dislike, but we don't hate. But now, Grandma, I understand how much love you had in your heart, that you didn't want to hate nothing. But now when you learn how to fight, <laughs> fight a good fight, oh, it's going to be some hate involved when you are fighting. You can't have no love in your heart when you're fighting. What I mean by that is, is when you prepare to go on the battlefield, love will get you hurt. Love will get you killed. Okay? So what I mean is that to fear the Lord is to hate evil. And when I say what I mean, I don't mean what I mean. I'm reading the scripture. To fear the Lord is to hate evil. I hate pride and arrogance, evil behavior and perverse speech. Strict training would look something like this. I'm not prideful. I hate pride. See, when it comes to being humble versus pride, it's not about, oh man, you're arrogant, you're boasting, you got a lot of money and you're, and you're we talking about God. <laughs> we ain't talking about among people. There are certain things you can do with people. There's offenses you commit against people. And there's offenses you can commit against God. And what, uh, was it Samuel? Let me think. I think it was Eli. Eli reprimanded his two sons. And he told them, he said, hey, if one person commits another offense against another person, God will intercede for that person. But if a person commits an offense against God, who's going to intercede for that person? You're, you're in direct trouble, buddy. Okay, now if you do something to another person, you know, God is going, the scripture says Jesus is interceding. Now that's Old Testament before the Messiah arrived, but in spirit, God is one. So, so the spirit is interceding, but point is, if you commit, there, there are differences between committing offenses between people and there are differences between committing offenses against God. This, I'm not even talking about that, but just get that in your mind. There's a difference, the sins of some, the sins of some are obvious reaching the place of judgment ahead of them. The sins of others trail behind them. So, um, now, it says, I hate pride, arrogance. I'm not arrogant, or uh, I hate arrogance. 
you would have to learn how not to be arrogant and then learn how to hate arrogance. That's what the Bible says. The Bible ain't never told you to hate it. If God hates it, how can you be one with God and not hate it? Either you 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 with him or against him. And if God is for you, who could be against you? So find out what, what race are you running? Which fight are you fighting? See what I'm saying? Find out what fight you fighting. Are you fighting God's fight? Because this book right here in Proverbs says evil behavior and perverse speech. My behavior, you have to learn what evil behavior is and say my behavior is not evil. I hate evil behavior. Binds, I bear the image of the heavenly man. Things that I say now, I say with a lot of confidence. It comes from strict training. It comes from strict studying. It comes from burning the midnight oil. So it comes from it come from confidence in the scriptures. And those who put their confidence in the scriptures shall never be put to shame. I'm not put to shame by anything I'm saying. I stand firm. Know what I say. My speech is not perverse, but I hate perverse speech. That don't mean you should you shouldn't use it, but it shouldn't be something that you your normal speech. Now, if you need to make a point about evil behavior, when I was young, they used to be I used to could tell my mama, mama, I hate that B. I T C H. I don't, I can't stand her. But a week later, I could be in the bed with her. How was that? I didn't hate her body. I hated the things that came from her, the things she said to me, the things that provoked me to bring out my evilness. We were both evil. Don't get me wrong. We both had evil behavior. But you hate the person's evil thoughts and evil behaviors and things that come from that person. You know, people just, they see potential in you. They want you to be a different version of what you are. And when you don't want to transform, they say things and do things and they conduct themselves in perverse speech and evil behavior. But once you become renewed, you have to learn that you need to be on the side of the creator and hate evil behavior, perverse speech, slander, filthy language, envy. You need to know why the creator is a jealous God and know why the fact that people are blatantly blaspheming his name should hurt the fact that people use Jesus Christ as a swear word. Jesus effing Christ. Why would you use his name that way? He's a sacrifice, atoning sacrifice for the sins of all of humanity. Why would you use his name that way? That should bother you. Bothers me now that I that I don't allow people to cut in on me on the truth. Now that I've gone into strict training. Now that I know what race I'm running. Now that I'm keeping the proper faith. Now that I live my life a living sacrifice which is my reasonable and acceptable sacrifice. Well, uh, maybe I said it wrong. Let's see if I can say it right. Uh, that's Romans. Romans, the 12th chapter. Uh, and, 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 and verse 1. Um, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. So, Go into strict training and say that I my speech is not perverse, but I hate perverse speech. Because the scripture says he Proverbs 3 and 34, he mocks uh he mocks proud mockers, but shows favor to the humble and oppressed. The book of James 4 6 quotes the same scripture, but quotes it a little differently. He says, but he gives us more grace. This is why scripture says God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. There's rules in this life when you're living, no matter if you know it or not. If you're proud, 
God opposes you. If you're humble, you're going to get favor. Last but not least, as I close today, I want to say in Proverbs 12 and 26, it says, The righteous choose their friends carefully, but the way of the wicked lead them astray. Dr. Burks told me one time, he says, Man, choose your friends like you choose your fruits and vegetables. You pick them up and you say, No, nah, I don't want that one. <laughs> that was a good one. Choose them like you choose... Man, if I see a spot on a, uh, you know, a fruit or a little dent, I only want the perfect ones. So choose your friends wisely. It says the righteous choose their friends carefully. You have to. Uh, let's go to Galatians, the sixth chapter. Um, let's see. Galatians, the sixth chapter. Uh, it says brothers and sisters. If someone is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit. Okay, so you who live by the Spirit. The ones that you have chose, the friends that you have chosen. Okay, you who live by the Spirit. Choose your friends who live by the Spirit. All right. Now, it says you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently, but watch yourself or you may also be tempted. See, if you have a bunch of friends that just says, hey, man, let's drink this, let's smoke this, let's do that, and let's bury our problems until you find out that your problems can swim, your problems can float. Choose your friends wisely so that you can be encouraged on the path. You guys got to uh, choose your friends. Choose the path that goes upward, not downward. If you don't know that you're going up, then it don't matter if you're going north, south, east, or west. You're going down. So choose your friends, get you a good group, and begin to ascend like an airplane, 20,000, 30,000 feet. The great thing about God is, is you can never stop ascending because he descended to the lower rank, uh, lower regions of the earth and then he ascended and he filled the whole universe with the spirit so might as well get you some get you some of this spirit get you some of this power remember he told his disciples in luke 24 go and wait for the power that my father has promised to send it's expedient that i go so I can send the comforter, the advocate, and it's going to help you. It's going to give you power to live this life on the path that leads to immortality. That's what I want. That's what everybody wants. And that's what we want for our friends and family. And if you don't know how to do it, hopefully I just helped you. I'll see you guys next time. Goodbye.